Good afternoon. The Secretary General and the Secretary of State will make introductory remarks and then they'll be happy to take a few questions. Secretary General. Secretary Blinken, uh, dear Tony, uh, welcome back to NATO. It's always great to see you here. And thank you for your uh, personal leadership and your personal commitment to our transatlantic uh, alliance. Today, the NATO flag and the flags of 30 allies are at half-mast to honor Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. She was a strong supporter of transatlantic alliance, of our armed forces and our values. She knew and worked with all NATO Secretaries General since the founding of NATO. She visited NATO headquarters and hosted NATO leaders at Buckingham Palace. I will always remember her wisdom, her warmth, and her strong personal interest in transatlantic security. Our heartfelt condolences to King Charles III, the royal family, and the people of our allies, the United Kingdom and Canada. We have just uh, concluded a meeting of the North Atlantic Council, where we addressed NATO's strong and united response to Russia's brutal war on Ukraine. This includes unprecedented military, financial and humanitarian aid from allies, so that Ukraine can uphold its right to self-defense. The United States is leading the way, and I welcome the billions of dollars of additional support announced this week. Yesterday, I participated in the US-led Ukraine Defense Contact Group in Rammstein. We all agree on the importance of stepping up and sustaining our military support so that Ukraine prevails as an independent sovereign state. In June, NATO leaders agreed a strengthened package of assistance with fuel, food, medical supplies, military gear, secure communications, and equipment to counter mines and drones. We will support Ukraine in the long term and help its transition from Soviet era to modern NATO equipment. The war in Ukraine is entering a critical phase. Ukrainian forces have been able to stall Moscow's offensive in Donbas, strike back behind Russian lines, and retake territory. Just in the last few days, we have seen further progress, both in the south in Kherson and in the east in the Kharkiv region. This shows the bravery, skills and determination of the Ukrainian forces. And it shows that our support is making a difference every day on the battlefield. In the coming months, our unity and solidarity will be tested. With pressure on energy supplies and the soaring cost of living caused by Russia's war. But the price we pay is measured in money, while the price the Ukrainians are paying is measured in lives, lost lives every day. And all of us will pay a much higher price if Russia and other authoritarian regimes see that their aggression is rewarded. If Russia stops fighting, there will be peace. If Ukraine stops fighting, it will cease to exist as an independent nation. So we must stay the course for Ukraine's sake and for ours. At the same time, we are sending an unmistakable message to Moscow about our readiness to protect and defend every inch of allied territory. We are significantly enhancing our presence in the east of the Alliance, putting hundreds of thousands of troops on higher readiness, supported with significant air and naval forces, and continuing to invest in cutting edge capabilities. All of this makes clear that our commitment to Article 5 is unshakable. Europe and North America must continue to stand together in NATO in defense of our people, our nations, and our values. So, Secretary Blinken, dear Tony, thank you again for your leadership, for being here, and for your strong personal commitment to our lines. Please, you have the floor. Jens, uh, thank you so much. Thank you especially for your remarkable leadership of uh, our alliance 
in what is a decisive period uh, for the alliance. We've come out of the NATO summit with a new strategic concept. We've uh, faced Russian aggression uh, in Ukraine. We've done it together, and that's in no small measure because of your uh, leadership. Uh, before speaking uh, about what brings me here today, I'd like to join uh, Jens in taking a moment just to honor the truly extraordinary life of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Um, on her 21st birthday, then Princess Elizabeth committed to dedicating her life to serving the people of the Commonwealth. For more than 70 years, a period during which the United Kingdom and the world witnessed unprecedented change, the Queen did just that, while personifying a sense of stability and continuity in turbulent times. She was a powerful unif unifying force, a source of comfort and resilience to millions of people from all walks of life. On behalf of the United States, I extend our deepest condolences to our British friends, to the government of the United Kingdom, to the royal family. So as Jens uh, noted, we just finished a session with our, our NATO allies where I had an opportunity to uh, share a readout of my talks in Kyiv with President Zelensky, uh, Foreign Minister Kuleba, and other senior Ukrainian officials. Um, I'll have an opportunity to speak to President von der Leyen from the uh, European Union tomorrow to continue uh, the strong transatlantic cooperation that we've had on Ukraine and on so many other things. Um, these consultations are just the latest example of the unity and strength of our alliance. Uh, yesterday, as I was in Kyiv, Secretary of Defense Austin uh, convened the fifth meeting of the Ukraine Defense Contact Group at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. More than 50 countries took part, including Ukraine's Defense Minister, as well as the Secretary General. Support from that group continues to make a decisive difference on the battlefield, where Ukraine's brave defenders are not just holding ground, they are retaking their sovereign territory in a two-front counteroffensive. Uh, as I told President Zelensky, the support of the United States is unwavering. Uh, I announced more than $2.8 billion in additional security assistance for Ukraine and also for its neighbors. That support includes $675 million in new military aid to Ukraine. This is part of the 20th drawdown of military equipment that President Biden has initiated going back before the Russian aggression. It includes more guided multiple launch rocket systems, artillery ammunition, high-speed anti-radiation missiles, anti-tank systems. 20th drawdown uh, now totals $14.7 billion. Um, that sum also includes approximately $2.2 billion in what we call foreign military financing for Ukraine, but also for European allies and partners. That will allow them to begin to acquire systems for the medium and long term that will be essential to deterring and, if necessary, defending against further Russian aggression in the years to come. Our unity here at NATO, across our alliances and partnerships, at the United Nations and other inter international institutions, is essential to advancing our objectives, shared objectives, supporting Ukraine's capacity to defend itself, sustaining pressure on Russia for its aggression, ensuring that Ukraine is in the strongest position when conditions are right for negotiations. For as President Zelensky has said, and rightly said, diplomacy is the only way to definitively end Russia's war of aggression. We see in this moment no indication from Russia that it would be prepared to seriously pursue such diplomacy, but if and when that time comes, Ukraine has to be in the strongest possible position. Now, President Putin thought that he would divide and weaken NATO. Today, the alliance is stronger, more unified, better resourced than ever before, and I heard further evidence in our session with NATO partners today. We'll soon welcome fin Finland and Sweden as new allies. We've approved a new strategic concept to meet 21st century threats, and more allies are meeting their pledge to spend 2% of their GDP on defense. President Putin thought that he would divide the Ukrainian people and swiftly absorb their nation into Russia. But the Kremlin's efforts to impose its will by force on Ukraine have only further united its people around the goal of defending their sovereignty and preserving a free and open democracy. President Putin thought his invasion would showcase the Russian military's might and sophistication. 
Instead, the Russian army is turning to North Korea and Iran for badly needed supplies, while Ukraine's military capability continues to get stronger thanks to its leadership, thanks to the courage of its fighters, and thanks to the robust support from allies and partners. President Putin thought that our willingness to apply economic pressure would fade with time. Instead, we and our partners and allies have stuck together in the face of Moscow's coercion and threats, imposing unprecedented costs on, Russians, uh, on Russia's economy. To date, over 1,000 foreign companies have quit the Russian market. Export controls on semiconductors and other advanced technologies mean that Russia cannot sustain, <coughs> never mind modernize, key sectors from automobile manufacturing to military exports to energy exploration. Russian imports of parts and finished products have been cut in half from a year ago. What does that mean? It means that they can't replace the weapons that they're using up in Ukraine, that they can't make products for their domestic market that their people are accustomed to buying. They can't produce things for export, which will shrink their foreign markets. Half a million people, half a million people, many of them highly skilled workers, have left the country. Russia's foreign exchange reserves are estimated to have fallen by $75 billion, and an additional $300 billion are currently frozen abroad. Meanwhile, Russia is cut off from international lending markets. All of this is building, it's cumulative, it will get to be a heavier and heavier burden as long as Russia's aggression continues. And yet, even as President Putin has failed in virtually all of his objectives, the human suffering he's inflicted on Ukrainians and on people around the world is staggering. I saw some of those consequences up close on my visit uh, yesterday in, uh, in Ukraine, including to Irpin, whose very name, like that of Bucha and Mariupol, has become synonymous with Russian war crimes, including indiscriminate violence and the intentional targeting of civilians. And I saw the costs in my visit to a children's hospital in Kyiv, where I met kids who will spend the rest of their lives without limbs, or with enduring brain injuries, or with other trauma that may be invisible to the eye because of atrocities committed by Russian forces. Hundreds more Ukrainian boys and girls have been killed by this unprovoked war. It's not just Ukrainians who are bearing the costs. As Russia falls short of its battlefield aims and is increasingly isolated uh, on the global stage, President Putin has turned to blunter tools to try to peel off support for Ukraine. He's weaponized energy against European countries standing up to his aggression, raising the costs on families, on businesses, on entire nations. President Putin is betting that these actions will break the will of countries to stand with Ukraine. He's betting that the Kremlin can bully other countries into submission. He's already lost that bet because the last six and a half months show a growing recognition around the world that while the costs of standing up to the Kremlin's aggression are high, the costs of standing down would be even higher. That's why the United States is doing everything in its power to support people around the world who are shouldering the greatest costs of Russia's aggression. Like our comprehensive efforts to help Europeans get through a winter during which they'll face heavy energy costs, making it hard for many to heat their homes. We won't leave our European friends out in the cold. It's also an opportunity to make a decisive shift, finally, once and for all, away from dependence on Russian energy which Putin will never stop trying to weaponize to Europe's detriment uh, and to make the transition to renewable sources necessary as well to combat the climate crisis. We can, we will emerge stronger and in a better place. And that's why it's so vital that we stay the course, that we stay united, united in support of Ukraine, united with our allies and partners, united for as long as it takes. Thank you. We'll take questions now. I see Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung up there. 
Thanks a lot, Thomas Kutschka, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. A question to you, Secretary Blinken. Um, we've seen this astonishing uh, move of Ukrainian forces in the northeast of their country, uh, pushing possibly 50 kilometers uh, into Russian-occupied uh, territory. How do you explain that? It appears the Russian uh, army is hardly even fighting. Is, that, is it on the brink of collapse in that area? Do you have an explanation for that? And do you see this potentially as a turning point in this war? And a question to the Secretary General, if I may. You've, you're constantly making the case for member states to send more ammunition, more arms uh, to Ukraine. One of the replies we are constantly hearing from our defense ministers is that it would compromise um, capacities that they have um, pledged to NATO. So when push comes to shove and member states do have to make a decision on either supporting Ukraine or holding up their commitments to NATO? What is your suggestion? What's the right decision to take? Oh, yes, I'm happy to start. Thank you. Um, let me say two things. First, what we're seeing is that the counteroffensive that uh, Ukraine has put in place with strong assistance and backing from many other countries is now underway. It's early days, but it is demonstrably making real progress. It's focused uh, in the south. Uh, around Kherson, uh, in that area. Uh, but we're also seeing Ukraine not only hold the line in, in the Donbass uh, and in the Northeast, but as you noted, uh, make a significant advance, uh, moving some 45 to 50 kilometers in one area past uh, what had been the existing uh, Russian line. I think it's too early to say uh, exactly where this will go, uh, when it will get there, and exactly where it will end up. But I think we can say that uh, Ukraine is proceeding in a very deliberate way with a strong plan and critically enabled by resources that many of us uh, are providing. But fundamentally, and I think this may explain more directly the, 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 the answer to, to your question, why am I absolutely confident in the success of uh, the Ukrainians in pushing back the Russian aggression? Uh, whether it's in um, the, Do the, the Northeast, the Donbass, or in the South, for one simple basic reason. This is Ukraine's homeland, not Russia. People are fighting for their homeland. They're fighting for their future. And while we can calculate the, the um, benefits of weapon systems and financial resources, it's hard to put a value on that determination to fight for one's own country, except to say that it's invaluable and the single biggest difference maker that I think we'll see play out over the weeks and months ahead. NATO allies have uh, provided unprecedented uh, support to Ukraine uh, with the weapons, uh, with uh, ammunition and other uh, capabilities. And of course, they have done that mostly by reducing existing stocks. Uh, and uh, you are right that, of course, some allies are now uh, raising the issue of uh, whether these stocks are depleted uh, too much. Uh, my answer to that is actually twofold. One is, of, is to realize that the weapons, the ammunition that we are providing to Ukraine are used to stop the aggressive actions of Russia against an independent sovereign nation in Europe, which is a close partner of, uh, of, uh, of NATO. And if President Putin wins in Ukraine, it's not only bad for Ukrainians, but it is also dangerous for all of us. So actually, by ensuring that Russia, that President Putin does not win in Ukraine, we are also uh, increasing our own security and strengthening uh, uh, the, the alliance by, by, by proving that we don't allow that kind of behavior uh, close to our own uh, borders. So. Um, the use of these stocks uh, actually helps to increase our own security and reduce the risk of any uh, aggr aggressive actions by Russia against uh, NATO allied countries. Uh, let me also add that more than 80% of Russia's land forces are now dedicated to the war in Ukraine. So of course what happens there uh, uh, matters for the total capacity of uh, of Russia to pose any threat to any NATO allied countries. So my first thing, my first message uh, to, to allies is that uh, we welcome the unprecedented support. We are calling for even more support. 
and we urge them to uh, dig deeper into the inventories to the SOCs to continue to provide the, the, need, the, the, the supplies uh, that uh, Ukraine needs immediately. And we see that this is making a huge difference on the ground uh, because as uh, uh, Secretary Blinken Tony just referred to, uh, there are, uh, we see progress uh, on the ground uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. But make no mistakes, we have to be uh, prepared for long haul. The second uh, answer to the concern about the level of stocks is of course to produce more. And therefore we are now in close contact with the defense industry, with capitals. We have established structures here at NATO on defense planning, uh, on, on, uh, on uh, capabilities, to ensure that we are now ramping up production, that we are replenishing the stocks, both to be able to continue to provide support to Ukraine, but this is not only about supporting Ukraine, it's also about ensuring that we have the weapons, the ammunition, the capabilities in place uh, for our own deterrence and defense. Okay, we have the Agence France Presse. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Secretary General. Um, can I follow up my colleague's uh, question a bit on, on the state of where it is? Uh, Russia has just announced that they're sending uh, reinforcements into the, into the Kharkiv area. How do you see this going? Do you think this is a sign of, how do you see this as a sign in terms of, of the direction that Russia is going in? And how do you see this as a, in terms of where, uh, where we could be seen in Kharkiv? And could I ask you also, uh, since we're talking about the alliance and unity among the within the alliance, uh, the question of Turkey. Um, Turkey, there are some concerns raised previously on Sweden and Finland. Uh, this past weekend, there were comments from President Erdogan regarding Greece um, and uh, comments perceived as, as, as threatening. Uh, how do you see the role of Turkey in this? Do you have any specific uh, re uh, reaction to President Erdogan's remarks this weekend? Thank you. Sean, thank you. Um, on the first question, uh, following up uh, on our German colleague, look, the, the counteroffensive, again, is in its early days. so. I don't want to prejudge, uh, as I said, where it will go and how far it, it will get, but the initial signs uh, are positive and we see Ukraine making real demonstrable progress in a deliberate way. But fundamentally, what we're also seeing, and we've seen this throughout, even as, even as President Putin threw as much as he could against Ukraine earlier this summer, um, Ukraine absorbed the blow and now is pushing back, enabled by, um, uh, by our partners and allies in the United States. But the single most important factor, I believe, is this. Ukrainians are fighting for their own country. The Russian forces in Ukraine, many of them have no idea why they're there. Um, some didn't even know where they were being sent. Uh, we see reports that their morale is low. Uh, and when you don't know what you're fighting for, that is something that's not uh, sustainable. Now, Russia has significant resources, military resources. It is acting in horrific, indiscriminate ways. Uh, Ukrainians are bearing an incredibly heavy cost, uh, as Jens alluded to. Their lives are on the line, and uh, even on the front lines now. Um, in, uh, in and around the, the Kherson area, even as they're making progress. They're bearing real costs, but fundamentally, they're fighting for their own homeland. They're fighting for their future. The Russian forces in Ukraine are not. And I'm convinced that that is the most decisive factor, and we're seeing some manifestations of that, but, but uh, this is likely to go on for some significant period of time. Uh, there are a huge number of Russian forces that uh, are in Ukraine, uh, and unfortunately, tragically, horrifically, President Putin has demonstrated that um, he will uh, throw a lot of people into this um, at huge cost to Russia, at huge cost to its future. And let me just add something I've said from the beginning. How is what Putin is doing, doing anything to improve the lives of the Russian people? How is this helping them? How is this assuring their own future? How is this creating opportunity for them? Not only is it not, it's doing just the opposite. It's cutting Russia off from the world. It's denying opportunity. It's depleting its resources, resources that could go to help the Russian people. Uh, in a closed information society that Putin has created in Russia, 
that information doesn't get there as quickly as it, uh, as it otherwise might, but uh, I believe it will. And Russians have to ask themselves why in the world uh, they are losing so many lives trying to take another country that is not theirs. Let me just briefly add that, uh, yes, we see some encouraging signs. Uh, the, the, the Russian offensive in Donbass has been stalled by the Ukrainian forces, and they have retaken some territory both in the, uh, in the east and in the uh, south. But make no mistake, uh, this can last for a long time, and at least we have to be prepared for long haul and be ready to provide uh, support to Ukraine uh, for as long as it takes. Wars are by nature unpredictable, and we know that uh, Russia uh, has a lot of military capabilities, and uh, they are willing to, to, to use them uh, to attack and sovereign independent democratic nation, as we have seen over the last month, uh, months in, in uh, Ukraine. Uh, the first task is actually to be prepared for the winter. Uh, the winter is coming, it's going to be hard, and therefore we need both to continue to supply weapons and ammunition, but also uh, winter clothing, uh, uh, um, tents, uh, generators, and all the specific equipment which is needed for, uh, uh, for the winter. Partly because the size of the Ukrainian army has just increased so much, they need more of this kind of uh, winter equipment, and NATO is particularly focused on how can we provide tens of thousands of, for instance, winter uniforms to uh, the Ukrainian uh, uh, army. On, um, on, uh, on Turkey and, uh, and uh, Greece, um, Turkey and Greece are two highly valued allies. They participate and contribute to NATO in many different ways. Any differences uh, between them, uh, of course, should be sold, uh, sold by diplomatic uh, means. Uh, we have also, at NATO, established uh, uh, what we call a deconfliction mechanism, where Turkey and uh, Greece can engage and have used this previously uh, to, to provide uh, uh, information, to, 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 to provide uh, um, uh, also, uh, uh, ways to de-conflict any, any uh, uh, dangerous situation uh, or behavior in, for instance, the GNC. New York Times. I'd like to follow up on Sean's question about uh, Turkey and just press a little bit more. You've talked about the importance of unity to the alliance. President Erdogan, in many ways, not only with this recent threat to Greece, seems to be threatening that unity. He's talked about another incursion into northeast Syria. Uh, he uh, renewed over the summer his threat to block the admission of Sweden and Finland into the alliance, and and then this latest uh, issue with, with Greece, among, among others. Uh, just can you talk a little bit more about the effect this has on the unity you say is so crucial? And specifically, Secretary Blinken, I, I believe I heard you say in your introductory remarks that you were confident or looking forward to Sweden and Finland being admitted into the alliance. Can you tell us what your basis for that optimism is, given that President Erdogan, as I said, renewed his threat over the summer to block their admission? And if I just might briefly ask you to talk a little bit about where things stand with the um, Iran nuclear negotiations. They appear to have stalled out, perhaps once and for all. Um, can they be revived and what comes next? Thank you. Uh, Michael, thank you. Um, and I'm really going to defer to the Secretary General on uh, the questions fundamentally related to NATO. Let me simply say this. First, with regard to, um, to Finland and Sweden, I think um, it's very clear that there is a strong alliance consensus, strong support uh, for their admission. We've seen the uh, ratification of the protocols process move forward with land record speed, um, and uh, there's strong support in the United States, of course, from both political parties. Uh, I had the honor of depositing the uh, instruments of ratification um, last month. Uh, so I'm uh, very confident that this is uh, moving forward, moving forward uh, deliberately, but I would uh, defer to, uh, to Jens uh, on anything further on that. Um, more broadly, uh, I can only repeat what Jens said, for example, about um, uh, Greece and Turkey, both vital, uh, important uh, allies, friends of the United States. They have differences, and of course, we'd like to see them uh, resolve these differences in a constructive way uh, through dialogue. Uh, they've uh, done so in the past, uh, and we would expect them to do so uh, going forward. And it is precisely because um, we have a fundamental challenge before us when it comes to Russia's aggression against uh, Ukraine. 
uh, a challenge that matters to every single ally and many countries well beyond the alliance, well beyond uh, the transatlantic area. Uh, and so we should be making sure that we're focusing all of our attention and uh, our resources as necessary uh, in uh, supporting Ukraine and pushing back against uh, Russia's aggression. Now, what I heard in the room today uh, with uh, all of our NATO partners uh, present was a very strong reaffirmation of that focus, of that unity, unity of purpose, unity of action. Uh, President Biden uh, heard that very clearly in a conversation that he initiated uh, just yesterday uh, with many uh, of our partners. Uh, Secretary Austin heard that and saw that at Ramstein, where uh, for the fifth time, this coalition of countries has come together to further uh, support Ukraine. So what I'm seeing as a practical matter is an alliance that is united and is focused on the biggest challenge that, um, that many of our countries face right now. Uh, with regard to uh, Iran and the, uh, the JCPOA, um, a few things. Uh, first, it's a negotiation. There's back and forth. Um, we have a response from uh, Iran uh, to what was put forward most recently by the uh, European Union. We've been uh, looking at that along with the uh, European partners. And needless to say, I'm not about to negotiate anything in public. Um, in past weeks, we had closed some gaps. Iran had moved away from some extraneous demands, demands unrelated to the JCPOA itself. However, uh, the latest response uh, takes us backwards. Um, and uh, we are not about to agree to a deal that doesn't meet our bottom line requirements uh, and or that tries to continuously introduce extraneous demands that um, are uh, not relevant to the JCPOA itself. Um, if we conclude a deal, it's only because it will advance our national security. The President is focused on that. And what we've just seen, again, would appear to move us backward, not forward. On um, differences in NATO, yes, of course, there are differences in NATO. We are 30 different uh, allies, uh, 30 different democracies, and of course, we don't always agree on all issues. And uh, that has been the case since this alliance was uh, uh, founded more than 70 years ago, dating back to the Suez crisis in 56 or the differences on the Iraq war t 20 years ago. And of course, we also see differences today. What makes NATO the most successful alliance in history is that we are able to overcome those differences and then make decisions together and uh, implement them together. And we saw that demonstrated at the NATO summit in Madrid just uh, uh, a few months ago. We made big decisions on uh, further increasing our presence in the eastern part of the alliance. We already had 40,000 uh, troops under NATO command as a direct uh, response to the Russian invention, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, as a attack on, uh, on Ukraine. And uh, we have also agreed to, 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 to strengthen the terms and defense uh, uh, um, uh, across the whole uh, alliance. We made also the decision to invite Finland and Sweden. That's an historic decision. Um, and all allies agreed uh, to invite them. Um, uh, and I also welcome that uh, so far this has been the fastest uh, accession process in NATO's modern history. Uh, uh, up to now, uh, 24 uh, allies have already ratified in the national parliaments uh, the accession uh, protocols, and, uh, including the US and the United States Senate. Uh, and, um, and I also uh, think it's important to recognize that we have to take the security concerns of all allies seriously, uh, uh, meaning that we need to address uh, the fact that uh, no other ally have suffered, uh, has suffered more terrorist attacks than Turkey. And therefore, I welcome that as part of the agreement in Madrid, there was a trilateral agreement between Finland, Sweden and Turkey to strengthen cooperation um, uh, uh, when it comes to fighting terrorism. Uh, they have established a permanent uh, mechanism to exchange more information, to, to, to exchange uh, intelligence, and to work more closely uh, together. So I'm confident that we will move forward uh, and that Finland and Sweden will become uh, members. And so far, this has uh, been uh, the fastest accession protocol process ever in NATO's history. I know there are more questions. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. So this concludes this press conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.